a friend of mine, um, Don Mumal, was the uh, pastor for Ronald Reagan. When Ronald Reagan was shot, you remember there was that, oh, yeah, remember. Yeah, that guy shot him? People don't realize that it was, I mean, it was so, he was so close to dying. Preston let out how severe that wound was. Nancy Reagan called for Don Mumol, the pastor of the Bel Air Presbyterian Church, to come to the president's side. So he flew across the country. And then when he went in to see the president, he asked the right questions. He said, Mr. President, are you ready to die? Ronald Reagan said, no, I'm not ready to die. I just started my presidency. There's so many changes I want to see made in America. There are so many good things that I want. He said, no, 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 no. I don't mean that. I mean, that bullet was a millimeter from the main artery to your heart. Mm. A millimeter to the left, and you wouldn't be here right now, and we're not sure you're going to make it through the night. Wow. If you were to die during the night and suddenly stood at the judgment seat of God, by what right would you claim the privilege of entering into heaven? And Ronald Reagan said, well, I'd tell the Father, you can't cast me away because I'm sinless. Every sin I ever committed has been transferred to Jesus on the cross, and I'm free from all sin. There's no basis for you to exclude me from heaven. That's not bad for a Republican. That's pretty good theology. Well, pretty good theology. That in reality, it's not your righteousness. Right. It's not you keeping the law. Exactly. We, not that we should disobey the law. Right. Paul writes, don't disobey the law that grace may abound. But it is by the grace of God, it's because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, that guarantees us eternal life. I really have to say that strong and clear. And there are those who want to reduce it to a lot of rules and regulations and say, you're a Christian if you do these things. Right. And so far as we make people into legalists instead of grace people, we get them ready for hell. And uh, that is uh, the worst thing that we can do. Well, that's why Paul railed against it. Yeah. In his day, it was circumcision. Can yeah, you imagine? Yeah. yeah. Circumcision. Yeah. Who was checking? Yeah. You know, we've got to check you at the door. I mean, wouldn't that be a horrible job? Uh, you would love this. A few weeks ago, I was uh, invited to speak to, at the uh, meeting of the Democratic National Committee. And they brought me into a special section, a special group, where there were Muslims and Jews and various kinds of Christians. There was, I was the only evangelical. And they said, we'd like Tony to explain to us what evangelicals are all about. Mm -hmm. So I stood up. And the first thing I said was, I know I'm supposed to be accommodating here. But let me tell you what we're really all about. And you won't understand us unless you understand this. I and every other true evangelical wants to convert every one of you to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I looked over to Muslims. We want to make you into people who surrender your lives to Christ. To the Jews, I said the same thing. I said it to everybody. I said, do you understand that? You won't understand us unless you s understand that we have this compulsion to witness for Christ and try to win every person we can to the Lord. I was wondering what the rejection would be. The Muslims said, that's OK. Our task is to try to win every Christian to Islam. Right. So, you know, I said, fine, then we understand each other. The Jewish guy said, look, we don't care about what happens when you're born again. We want to know what we're going to be able to do to you eight days after you're born again. Uh -huh. <laughs> the circumcision yeah. stuff. But I think uh, we have to clarify uh, that there is no other name under heaven except through salvation in Christ. And I'm not ashamed to stand uh -huh. up and say that. And you know what? They all knew that before I said it. Sure. And they're sick and tired of Christians who are trying to pretend that they're, we, we all believe the same thing. We all have, we don't all believe uh -huh. the same thing. Can you respect me in spite of the fact that of what I believe? Because I, I'm going to. It doesn't mean we ain't going to quit trying to convert that's, you. That's right. You know, I mean, I can respect you. And, but if I get an open door, I'm going to do my best to tell you about right, Jesus. You got it. You got it. If we don't do that, we're yeah. not being faithful to Christ, are we? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it used to be that for me. I just, I'm going to be faithful to Christ, and I'm getting on the plane, 
and I'd witness to people without really ever taking the time to hear their story. But when I gave up this idea that their blood will be on my hands if I don't lead them in the sinner's prayer before we end this flight, when I gave up that idea that I don't really have to do that, I mean, if I, sometimes I'll get the opportunity to do that, but it doesn't have to happen. Sometimes you've got to just plant seed, y'all. Sometimes you water it, and then every now and then you get to harvest. I, uh, you know. I, I, I was a speaker at a missions conference up in Calgary, Canada. One of the other speakers was the very famous preacher, Jack Hayford. Mm -hmm. He was the other speaker. And I know he's a little concerned about me because I'm so much into social justice themes. And he was worried that I didn't have enough emphasis on winning people to Christ. Well, we got down to the airport, and lo and behold, we're on the same plane going to really? L.A. He's in first class, however, and I'm back in tourist. Uh -huh. So I sit down, and he says, I'm going to come back and talk to you. But he took an awful long time to get back there. In the meantime, uh, this very lovely woman sitting to my left got talking to this young man on my right. And the conversation got around to something religious. And I interjected myself. And the next thing you know, they were wanting to know what this was all about. And I began to explain to them Jesus. And at one point she said, well, how can, how can I have Jesus in my I mean, how can I have this kind of experience? I said, I'm not sure it's going to be a smash, bam, alakazam experience. But he'll come into your life if you ask him to. He says, how do I do that? I said, it's easy. Let's bow our heads and you just say this prayer as I say it and make it your own. We're just about to start the prayer when Jack Hayford comes back. Oh. And he says, I want to talk to you. I said, could you wait just a few minutes, Jack? I'm trying to lead this woman to Christ. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so, you know, we had a prayer. And well, I, that must have told him. Yeah, yeah, told him all. He yeah. didn't even want to talk about it after that, yeah. you know. And you know what? About seven or eight months later, I was speaking up in Edmonton, Canada, which is north of Calgary, about maybe 200 miles. Mm -hmm. And when I came to the meeting, <coughs> standing there at the front door was this woman who had driven all the way up from Calgary because she wanted to personally thank me for leading her to Christ and letting me know that she had become a member of a church and she had been baptized and she was she's really found what we what she was looking for. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. You gotta tell that's people. That's what it's all about. You know, and you don't have to impose <coughs> on people. When I when I when I get on a plane or I, I'm ready to witness, I pray, Lord, prompt this person to start a conversation with me. I don't have to start it. I, if the Holy Spirit is at work in that person's life, that person will start the conversation. And if the Holy Spirit isn't at work in that person, there's no point in me even talking to him because my words aren't well, going to convert the them. the Spirit that draws them. Oh, it's, all my words are is a witness to what the Holy Spirit is already at work trying to do in their lives. Wow. It's explaining what's happening. Huh. That's what God is at work changing you at this very moment, I say. Now, you don't know you do you don't know the name of that God, but his name is Jesus. Jesus is in you. Uh, or else you wouldn't have even started this conversation. You wouldn't even ask me the questions that you did, except that the Spirit of God was prompting you. And what I'm asking you to do is to let that Christ who is already at work in you to become Lord of your life in total control. So that's the way I witness. I always pray the Holy Spirit will prompt people to listen. Uh, when I go out to preach, I say, Holy Spirit of the Lord, I do hope and pray that you're at work in the lives of my listeners because nothing that I'm going to say is going to do it right. When, and you know, the thing is, if you conform them, if you convince them apart from the Spirit, then you conform them into your image and your way of thinking, and then they're just a broken freak like you. But if you allow the Spirit of God to conform them, they'll end up like Jesus. It's